Hi, good evening everybody. So my name is Marika. I'm the sports physiotherapist at sportsinjuryphysio.com where you can get online physiotherapy appointments using Skype video calls. So tonight's topic is all about ankle sprains and I am going to cover what happens to your ankle when you sprain it, um, how long your recovery periods um, can take, when you should go to A&E and when you should be okay to try it out on your own. And then lastly, what type of treatments you should be using when you do sprain your ankle. Okay, so let me just move this thing back so that you can get a proper view of my ankle. Now, your ankle joint or your, yes, your, your ankle joint or ankle complex is formed by your two bones that comes from the top and they form um, a little hollow for the bones from the foot or the talus to sit in. So essentially it looks like like that. Okay. And as you move your foot up and down, it slides up and down in it. Then your foot can also turn in and out and that's what happens there. Okay. So you've got the bones coming together. The bones are covered in cartilage. So inside the joint, then you have a strong um, capsule around your joint. You can think of it as holding the joint together. And inside that capsule, it's filled with fluid called synovial fluid. And that's because joints don't have arteries going into them. That fluid is um, the stuff that keeps all its nutrients and keeps it lubricated and fed. Now, then outside of the capsule, you've got ligaments that connect the bones together and you have strong, strong ligaments on the inside running from your um, tibia to your foot and different parts of or bones of the foot. Then you have strong ligaments on the outside of it running from your fibula to different parts of your foot. You've also got a ligament between the two bones in your lower leg and there are several other little ligaments around there and quite a few ligaments in the foot connecting the bones together there. Then of course you also have muscles and tendons crossing over. Now how muscles work is you've got the muscle belly somewhere in the, um, the lower leg and then that muscle belly attaches to a tendon which is for me you can probably see my my thick tendon of my tib ant out there. A tendon is made of similar things to um, or similar material to ligaments and is really um, strong and tough and that connects the muscle belly to the bone and depending on where it attaches it allows the body to move different parts into different directions so when you go over on your ankle you often also pull some of those tendons and some of the muscles um, okay so what am i leaving out now i've made myself a list to not forget things um, yeah, that's about it. So to summarize it, things you can injure, you can injure the cartilage inside the joint, you can injure the bones, you can um, sprain the capsule of the joint, you can sprain the ligaments or tear the ligaments, you can also sprain or tear the tendons or the muscles themselves. Now, when should you go to A&E? The main times that you should go to A&E is one, Say you sprain your ankle now and it literally balloons up with swelling within half an hour. I would go to A&E in that instance purely because that often indicates an injury that's happened inside the joint and they often can go hand in hand with um, fractures and things and it's best to have that in investigated or checked over by somebody. Now the second time or the second reason you should go to A&E is if you suspect you've broken something in your ankle. So how can you decide you've, whether you've broken something or not? Um, I don't know if you've heard of the Ottawa rules. Now, my blog post that I've got on the subject um, describes the Ottawa rules in detail, and I'll post that later in the group. Um, but it basically states that you can, be you can be relatively certain that you've broken a bone in your ankle when you sprained it or your foot if certain parts of the, the bone is painful to, to touch. So the first one is if we look at the bone on the outside of the foot and I've drawn a line around it so that you can see it better. If you press on the bony bit towards the back of it in this area and follow it up there and it's really painful to press on the bone, then you may have broken that bit. I'm not talking about it just being tender. It's got to be painful. And also it's not 
the soft tissue underneath or around the bone because that's your ligaments that's not the bone then the second one is if you look at the bony prominence here on the inside which I've drawn a line around if you press on that bit of the bone and that's painful then you may have broken that bit then you've got a little bone in the foot called the navicular and that's a common one that people can also break so that is not you'll notice it's not right in front of there it's slightly further forwards and again we're talking not about it being just tender it's got to be painful when you press on it and then number four is well I've got quite a prominent knobbly bit on the side of my foot and that's the base of my fifth metatarsal or my fifth um, bow, bone to the fifth toe or my little toe and that knobbly bit there if it's really painful to press on that it's worth having it checked out because that's also a common place where you can break your foot of course you can break it in any place but those are the most common places and then lastly the rules also state that you should be able unable to give four steps with it so say for instance you've sprained your ankle today it's a couple of hours later you've put some ice and things on it and you're trying to walk on it but you really can't can't put any weight on it and I'm not talking about it hurts when you put weight on it it's literally you can't give four steps going forward on your foot then I would also go to A&E that they check it out for you good so now you are sure that you haven't broken your your leg or your ankle how long will it take to heal well that all depends on what things you've injured in it and how severe your injury is so if you what I find with my patients if they have a lot of swelling inside the joint and that they've bruised the bone itself then those sprains can take a very long time they usually take minimum of eight weeks but usually more than 12 weeks to get better if however you've just um, sprained the ligaments a little bit grade one tear where you've just pulled the fibers slightly those sprains can actually get better within four weeks um, and it's difficult to explain it in terms that everybody will know exactly how long their ankles will take to heal because it, it takes quite a bit of experience and seeing how your ankle recovers within the first week to, to make a decision on that but what I can say as a rule of thumb that I see in clinic is um, if your range of movement in your ankle improves dramatically after the, the first five days that you it becomes a lot more comfortable to walk those patients usually take between four and six weeks to recover the ones where it's really stiff at the beginning a lot of swelling and a lot of bruising they take between 8 to 12 weeks and it can even take longer um, so it just all depends on what things you've actually injured now what can you do to treat it so I'm going to break this up in initial treatment and then longer term treatment and for initial treatment we're looking at the moment that you sprain your ankle so as soon as you sprain your ankle stop doing what you're doing and the reason for this is um, when you for instance the, the most common sprain is when you go over on your ankle like that so when you go over on your ankle like that you are you've pulled the ligaments you've likely also squashed the joint on this side and you may have even pulled the tendons of the, the muscles the bruising that you see from that is because little blood vessels um, also get pulled and get damaged and then the blood goes out of them now if you continue your sport that area is now slightly weaker than what it was before you injured it so it's even easier to injure it further you can also cause the bleeding to be a lot worse than what it would be if you stopped immediately and the problem with a lot of swelling if you have a lot of swelling and a lot of bruising in an area is that it's very difficult for the blood supply to then get to the other healthy tissue so what you can get is that the tissue around the stuff that you've injured actually becomes damaged because it can't get enough oxygen so your first in the first instance your treatment should all be aimed at protecting the structures you've injured and stopping the bleeding so that you get limited swelling in that okay so you stop the activity that you're busy with you apply ice as soon as you can and the reason for applying ice in this instant instance is to get the blood vessels to constrict because you know how if you get really cold your fingers go white 
that's because the body's trying to preserve its heat and it, it closes the blood vessels down. And in this case, you want them to close down because then the bleeding stops inside and you limit the secondary damage from it. So you ice it for 10 minutes max. Why only 10 minutes? Because if you do it for longer, the body may think that, oh, now the skin and everything's getting too cold. So it needs to blood to rush back into it to protect it from getting a cold blister or cold injury. So if you ice it for longer than 10 minutes at a time at this stage, you may actually make the swelling worse because you'll get the blood vessels opening up again. Then other things you can do to help limit the, the bleeding and the swelling is you can elevate your foot above your heart so you can lie with your foot nice and high. You can also um, do some gentle compression around it. Now, again, if you're going to wrap something really tight around it, you're going to limit the blood supply to that area and you can actually cause more damage. Compression for injured joint is just firm. It shouldn't be really tight, tight, tight. Okay. Um, good. Then let me think. What else about protection did I want to say? It's popped out of my head now, but I'll think in a minute. Now, a lot of people tend to think, ooh, inflammation, need to pop some anti-inflammatories. But actually, there's good research out there to show that you need to stay away from anti-inflammatory drugs within the first three to five days. And the reason for this is you've not damaged some cells in there. The body needs to get rid of the damaged cells to actually rebuild it back strongly again. But it can only get rid of it through the inflammatory process. So in this case, inflammation is really useful, as long as it's not overboard, of course. But usually with ankle sprains, if you look after it and you treat it well with ice and things, it won't be overboard. Um, so try not to take anti-inflammatory drugs. If it is really painful, chat with your doctor and see if there's any pain medication that isn't anti-inflammatory that you can use for the pain. Even your pharmacist may be able to assist you with that. In the UK, they often say paracetamol, but you've got to check if you're on other medication and things, it may not be safe for you to take. Um, okay, so that's my piece set about anti-inflammatory drugs. Then often people will say, but you should stay away from ice as well, because again, that will cause the inflammation to decrease and therefore it will stop the injury from healing. But a few points on that. One, within the initial phase, you really need the bleeding to stop. So at that point, stopping the bleeding is more important than the inflammatory phase and you don't have inflammation at that point yet. Then secondly, because you're only putting the ice on for 10 minutes at a time, its anti-inflammatory um, reaction is much, much less than if you took anti-inflammatory tablets, because things like ibuprofen take six hours for your body to get rid of it, whereas the ice is only on there for 10 minutes, and then the cooling effect immediately starts decreasing once you take it off. So don't worry about that too much. You don't want to, within the first three days again, alternate heat and ice. And the reason for that is alternating heat and ice actually increases the circulation to the area. And your blood vessels may still be a little bit vulnerable to bleeding within those three the first three days. So stay away from that contrast treatment. After day three, it's absolutely safe, should be safe to do it. Okay. Um, then crutches is a really good thing to use if your ankle is really painful. So if you're struggling to put weight through it, take half your weight off. You can either use a stick or you can use crutches. And the idea there is that if you can protect it a little bit for a few days, then you will just get the injury to heal better. But what I would say is don't use crutches for longer than two days if you don't go and consult a doctor or a physiotherapist, because using it for a prolonged period may also not be useful. Um, there are definitely cases where I've told people to use it for a week or so, but that was because the extent of the injury really warranted it. OK, so get some guidance with that. Now, with regards to ankle braces and boots and things like that, if you have a severe ankle sprain and we suspect that um, you've really torn the, the ligaments uh, grade two plus or grade three even, it may be useful to actually immobilize your foot in a brace or boot that only allows movement in the plane that doesn't strain the ligament because that will help the ligament to heal. But again, prolonged use of those things are not useful because then you actually lose your muscle bulk and things. So it's really good to get some guidance from a physiotherapist or um, somebody similar to understand when to use it 
and when to start weaning yourself off it. Um, I find that ankle braces is really useful when my patients go back to sport, um, especially footballers, because with football, you've got loads of um, twisting and turning. And by using an ankle brace in the early stages, it actually allows them to get back to sport quickly um, while protecting the ankle and we can continue with the rehab. But again, that's something that uh, a physio will be able to actually advise you on when it's useful and when not. Now, lastly, the other really important bit is that even in the early days, you should start moving the joint. So the reason for that is, again, remember, your joints don't have arteries going into them. They need movement to get fluid in and out and nutrients in and out. And especially if you've, if you've strained the cartilage inside the joint a bit, if you just keep it rock solid still, you're not really giving that cartilage the nutrients and things that it needs to recover. So what I usually tell people to do is from the second day after injury. So if you've injured it today, absolutely fine to keep it still and apply ice and things like that. But from tomorrow morning, start gently moving it. And usually what you want to do is you're aiming for pain-free movement. So let's take the inversion sprain again as an example. So you've gone over on your foot and you've pulled everything over this bit and it's really painful to move your foot in. You don't have to do that movement. You rather do up and down because with that movement, there's very little strain going through the injured part, but you're getting lovely movement in the joint and helping everything else with its circulation and there's a golden rule with this type of thing what you'll find is if you move it just to the point where you first feel discomfort but you keep on moving it after about 10 repetitions you'll find that you can actually move it a lot further without pain so for this stage of an ankle sprain and i would say that that probably applies for the two first two weeks for me I don't know other people may not agree with that um, I usually tell people that you keep it moving but you respect pain so you don't push into pain you just push into slightly uncomfortable um, and I usually get them to stay away from the, the injuring movement to give those ligaments and things just a little bit of time to stabilize okay so now we're past week one it's time to start strengthening so what should a rehabilitation program for an ankle sprain involve? Now, let me first explain to you why it's important to actually spend the time to strengthen that ankle up again. Um, you know, when you close your eyes, you know exactly where your toes, your fingers, everything is. I've spoken about this in the past, but that's called position sense or proprioception. Now, the reason your brain knows where your ankle and your toes and everything is, is that there are little mechanoreceptors in the joints, in the ligaments, all of that. That's forever feeding back to your brain where your feet and things are and also what position it's in. That's the reason why you can run downstairs without actually falling over your own feet because your brain's getting the feedback of, oh, we're there, we're there, we're there. It's actually really amazing when you think about it. Now, whenever you sustain a sprain of a joint or a ligament or any type of injury, that message gets a little bit fuzzy. So the brain doesn't quite get that message properly. Also, some of the muscles um, may switch off and if you or um, be sprained or um, even torn. And if you don't strengthen them back up, you, you don't actually have the ability to properly control the ankle. So what you may find is that I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but if you've strained your ankle once, it's quite easy just walking on flat ground to suddenly go over on it. And you go, what's just happened there? There was no reason to go over on it. Now, we call that a functional instability because what it means is there's nothing wrong with the ligaments. They've all properly healed. But the problem is that because your control from the muscles or the message to the brain isn't as it should be, your brain can't control your ankle properly. And then you place it in a position that it can't, it's unstable. So a functional stability is something that can easily be fixed if you have the right exercises for it. Um, very well, so let's dive into that. Your first step will always be to get your range of movement back and that you can literally start working on day two. Now, one of the questions in the group was um, from somebody who sprained his ankle um, over six weeks ago 
and he's still struggling to get the full dorsiflexion the full bending up motion is not the same as the other ankle and he was asking about how long can it take to get the same now if you did a proper job of spraining the ankle and it involves the joint inside that can takes take up to 12 weeks sometimes um, but it is something that you can get better through persistent movement through the joint now we used to think that strong stretches taking a joint into a position it and holding it there was the way to go but actually what we've now learned is that doing active stretches where you move in and out of that position um, is a much better way to get that range of movement going so an example where I would go with the dorsiflexion the bending up range of movement is I would always start with taking it up and down just free actively once that is comfortable then I would start doing things like <clears throat> um, let me just get this out of the way where you kind of do that movement so you can see it's the same as bending it up but now I'm getting my body weight through it and we're doing a nice movement into that movement now also a very good one is if you do heel raises but over the side of a step so that you get that last little bit now ah oh, I've got a book here so to explain that properly can you see if I go up and down on my toes on this at that bottom bit I'm getting that range of movement and the nice thing about this is I'm getting two flour two um, two things with one go I'm getting strength in my calf control around my ankle at the same time as I'm getting some range of movement in there okay so how do you know you've got enough range of movement in there basically you move your good ankle that's not been injured into all different positions and then try to mimic it with the other one and see what is restricted so quite often also um, it's not just the upwards movement but the downwards movement so sitting with your legs straight out in bed and having both of them there and pointing your toes down is a good way of seeing can they actually both go equal um, and the same thing for moving the feet in and out now if the ankle is past its really painful point and you find that it's really stiff it doesn't want to move in and out you can even use your hand to do those movements um, to help it along but never should you force it to the point where it's actually painful uncomfortable is fine but painful is not fine okay so that's range of movement for you then secondly you've got to work on the proprioception which is that position sense I spoke about and luckily it's quite easy to do that so the easiest way to test how good your position sense is is by standing on one leg now actually I'm gonna see if I can move this just there so that you can see me fully um, there we go okay so if we that doesn't really work does it let's see okay so if you stand on one leg can you easily stand there without falling over and without being really wobbly and without your ankle doing that now by the ways if you stand on one leg and you achieve it by pushing the ankle in and just collapsing it all that doesn't really count you've got to be able to keep your arch in a good position and balance on one leg now if that's really easy then check can you do it while you actually move your head around side to side let me move it up here to give you a better idea of what I'm doing there um, okay so can you balance on one leg yes you can now can you do that without staring at one spot so can you do it moving your head side to side and you'll notice actually for this right ankle of mine I'm struggling with that a little bit but still I can do that um, and then also can you do that with your eyes closed because immediately when you do that now your brain can't actually use the feedback from your eyes to balance so that's a way how you can improve that bit for you for yourself um, then actually I've just touched on 
the position of the foot. So when we're standing, we all have an arch in our foot. Some of us have really high arches. Some of us have slightly flatter arches. Often when you've injured your ankle, you may find that your arch, your foot wants to roll in afterwards. Now, that can cause a bit of problems because if you do that, it compresses the one side of the joint. And often if the pain doesn't want to go away, that can be part of the problem. So you may even find that using some orthotics in the short run that just lifts the arch up a little bit can be quite useful for that. So I would strongly suggest that you do some exercises to strengthen the feet and the arches up as well, because that will um, help the ankle position in the, in the long run. Now also, you've got loads of muscles around the joint and a joint can be strong and the ligaments can be strong. But as I said before, if the muscles that surrounds it has been injured and aren't strong, then you don't have the control around the ankle that you should. So you should also be strengthening the muscles that turn the foot out, turn the foot in and the calf muscles that control the up and down movement. OK, so that's really important. But now also your muscles in your buttocks are quite important. So I've spoken in the past a lot about hip control. Let me show you why I'm on about that. So if you can remember, a quick test for hip control is when you stand on one leg and do a single leg squat. Now, when you do that, you want to see that your pelvis stays level and your knee moves nicely in line with the middle of your foot. OK, so poor hip control would look like that and the knee will go in like that. So we're not in a straight line like when you go there. OK, now what happens if your knee turns in, then you're actually also pushing your foot over and then it squashes in that bit, which can cause a condition called sinus tarsi syndrome, which can be really painful. So strengthening up your hip muscles and your glute muscles are really important. And what I'll do is I'll post a link to the article that I wrote about glute strength for you that you can have a look at those exercises. OK. Now. We've looked at your range of movement, proprioception, ankle strength itself, foot strength, hip strength. And then lastly, you've done all of these strengthening exercises but now you've also got to do sports specific exercises. So especially if we think of um, things like um, football or running off road, you've got to be able to change direction quickly. You've got to be able to jump and hop. So those are things that you specifically need to train the ankle for again. And it will all depend on your sport, um, what you do for that. But you usually start with slow, easy things and then move on to more difficult things. While I'm thinking of that, Often when people come in with sprained ankles that doesn't want to get better and I ask them about what they're doing, um, they list things like they're on balance boards and stuff like that. Balance boards are great, but you know what? Don't get on a balance board if you can't balance on one leg on the floor while turning your head. Because what's the use of then trying to be on an unstable surface? You've got to be able to do all the balance activities properly on the floor first before you move on to using something fancy like a balance board. But there are extremely good um, tools to strengthen up ankles. Now, let's see. I've got a question that's come in. Um, on the subject of arches, as a larger guy, I have almost flat, flat feet, but I also get um, way on my trainers on the outer left and right of my feet, trying to understand how and why. Now, that is because flat feet are not necessarily equal to pronating more. Um, so it may very well be that your feet are flatter, but that you make contact with the outside of your feet when you run and walk more than the inside. And the only way that you can really um, figure out what's happening there is if you'll film yourself. So if you've got access to a treadmill, then get somebody to film yourself from the back walking and see what your feet does. OK. There's a really good app called Huddle Technique and Huddle spelled H-U-D-L and then just technique. And if you film yourself through that, you can really slow it down and you can check it all in slow motion. Um, so that may be useful. Um, 
but yeah, maybe I think what I'll do is I'll um, just tag Glenn into this and maybe he wants to give us some advice on that as well. But I think it's mainly because flat feet doesn't necessarily equate pronation. Excellent. I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover. So remember, if you want some bespoke advice about your specific injury, a video consultation works really well because I can see you move. I can um, help you diagnose what you've injured. And then I'm happy to provide you with a program that's actually specific for you. Let me know if you've got any questions and take care. See you guys next week. Thank Bye -bye. you for watching. If you would like to learn more about preventing sports injuries, make sure you hit the subscribe button. See you next time.